one of the things we say uh, during davening three times a day, twice in Shacharit and once in Mincha, is Ashrei. So uh, Ashrei is a praise. I'm just sorry, I'm just trying to find it here. Um, it's a praise of uh, and thanking Hashem for uh, certain things. And uh, we say it, it's, they say it's a very good thing to do three times daily, like usually we say the Shema twice a day. And um, it's written using the whole alphabet, the Aleph base. It starts with Ashray, which is Aleph, all the way to Zion, which is interesting. All, all the verses are written, um, are written uh, basically alphabetically. And it says, uh, it's, it's a comp compilation of Psalms uh basically that it says one who one who recites ashray three times a day is guaranteed a place in the world to come a secure future uh is 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 quite the promise this is from my jewish learning okay so ashray also uh shows us how to be happy and appreciate things and uh one of the the main verses that we have to focus on is when you say I said it yes. I said it yesterday. When you when really, yeah. you know, the one, the, one of the lines in Ashray is Potech et Yatecha, Umas be lechol charsom. Potech, Hashem opens his hands, Umas be lechol charotzon, and he, um, set he uh, satisfies all living kinds. So that's when you see people daven. Some people when they when they bench, which is also the benching. They open their hands like that. They say, And they say, when that part of Ashray is recited, um, we should think of the, and have gratitude to what that Hashem provides us with all our needs. So, um, um, as I say, I'm trying to say something else. Give me one, one more minute or so. I just want to find something else, what it says here. Um Okay, one more thing here. Um, okay, I can't find anything. Um, it's uh, okay, and it uh, one, one the thing it also says here is uh, we it's it's based on trust and trusting that Hashem provides for our needs, and it's linked to linked to Emona. Um, that Hashem provides, and uh, we must just have him and obviously try our best to succeed in whatever we're trying to do. And um, Hashem, and I've heard Shirim, Hashem will even provide for the biggest criminals and terrorists. They get their needs met. They have, if eat, have three meals a day. So if he provides for creatures like that, uh, why shouldn't he provide for people like us? Good point. So, I have to ask you a favor, Kev. Uh, first thing is, I want you to explain something to me. When it says, it says Hashem satisfies the desire of every Oh, desires. And the difference is, is that it says in Picavot, we don't leave this work with, uh, with Half our desires met. Meaning, if somebody gets two million, they want four. If they get four, they want eight. If they have one hot chick, they want another. They just goes on yeah. and on. So, firstly, why does it use that word desire instead of need? And we all know that many people desire for children, desire for maybe a spouse or money, and yet their needs, uh, Hashem doesn't fulfill the desire of every living person. So it's yeah, on Hashem. I'm not questioning Hashem. I'm questioning the word desire as opposed to need. Okay, so I found something here as you were saying that. It says yeah, um, it says opening to the flow of goodness allows me to relax. When I relax, I open further to that flow that which fills me and satisfies the deep yearning for connection to my source. In letting go of struggle, tension, and attachment to outcome, I am free to embrace this moment just as it is, 
and receive the gift that I am being given, what I am being given. Okay, that's... Uh, so it satisfies the desire as long as our desire is to serve Hashem. But any self-desire is not satisfied because by virtue of its definition, it can never be. Because the minute we get what we desire, we no longer crave it in the association. Okay. So this is more of an existential chat. One question, guys, if you don't. Mission. I thought we'd never get here. Um, so, just bottom line is the Gomorrah makes a commentary regarding the Mishnah's ruling that a son who robbed his father must return the theft to the other heirs. If you remember, Raf Yosef said yesterday, if he doesn't have any other heirs, in other words, he doesn't have brothers, uh, or his father doesn't have brothers, he's got no option but to remove the items or item that he stole from his father and now and currently in his possession. And he's got two choices. Guys, he can donate it to the cough of a charity fund. Um, there is this issue about giving it to the Kohen if it's an atonement on behalf of Hashem. Uh, Rav Papa said, listen, just remember that when he gives it to charity, he's got to say, this is the robbed property of my father. Meaning that people have the tendency for self-delusion, which means they, they go and they say, well, here's the big money for the shul, the tzedakah. Now everybody thinks it's a tzaddik. Now, instead of feeling bad about what he did, he actually starts to think, hey, I'm a pretty good guy. <laughs> so human nature, our papa's saying he's got to become clear. And there's a whole discussion, according, for example, to the Rambam, who says that he's got to discuss with all his relatives when he gives it to them, if there are heirs, that this is money he stole from his father. According to Rashi, he doesn't have to make that statement to the uh, family, in case of the drama. He mainly has to make it to uh, a case where it's a charity if... He doesn't have brothers or his father doesn't have brothers. So the Gemara wonders about the Mishnah's ruling. And there seems to be a bit of a weird question because it seems obvious that you give back that which you stole. Because you can't have robbed property in your possession. The Pasuk uh, discusses returning it. So Gemara says, what are you talking about? Why must uh, the robber relinquish the stolen property to other heirs or charity? Let him forgive himself this debt. Okay, so you're saying, okay, so what do you mean forgive yourself? Everybody could turn around and say, well, I'm not such a bad guy, forgive myself. But it's actually a term because it's not like the robber needs to formally forgive himself the property. Because what we are saying is this term forgive himself means once his father dies, he inherits it. And therefore, his obligation to return it is automatically annulled. Okay? So the expression forgive oneself is just to convey an idea, guys, that the robber is absolved without the victim's wavering of payment through his own succession to ownership of the property. Meaning, if his father was alive, he'd have to give it back to his father. But since he um, has inherited it anyway, it's a term of wavering his responsibility to return it by virtue of inheritance, okay? Um, so um, that's basically the, the issue we're dealing with. And we say, well, well, where do you learn such a concept? And we learned this in the Mishnah 103a, because it said if the victim forgave the robber the principle, but to not forgive him the fifth, etc., he need not pursue the victim to media in order to pay him. So if you remember there, it's the robber's obligation to make restitution at all costs, and he had to schlep to some faraway land, pertains only to the principal amount that he actually stole. But it doesn't pertain to the one for surcharge that the Torah imposed upon him. And the reason that he has to schlep all the way to media or any faraway land is because he made a false oath that he never took the principal. If he just took the principal, it's okay if he gave it to 
a local agent and then he just informed the uh, victim, listen, when you come back into town, collect it. It was the false oath that made him obligated to follow in order to get atonement to bring the one for surcharge and the Asham offering. But he has to uh, schlep now. Once the principal amount has been forgiven, for example, by the victim, the robber need not pursue his victim to media or any faraway land in order to pay the surcharge. Do remember, there was a issue later on with the court, and Gavin says, well, we don't know why they never thought about this before, and he's right, is that there was a local court-appointed agent where you could give that money, uh, and the uh, victim, upon returning back to that country, could collect it from the court-appointed agent because, number one, as Arthur said, the court-appointed agent was trustworthy. And the second thing of it is, uh, Arthur also said this, is like nobody's going to spend five times the amount um, to travel for logistics for the amount he stole. Nobody's going to then have it to shiver and admit it that they swore falsely because of the implication of having to schlep all the way to a faraway land. So if any, it would deter some sort of to shiver, and therefore, as Arthur said, that this rabbinic enactment was to aid somebody that genuinely wanted to pay the principal. The one for surcharge and the asham, which in itself is very heavy, but doesn't have to schlep all the way there. So we learn this concept bottom line that the victim can forgive the robber, the principal. And that even if uh, uh, the um, robber, you see the robber still has to make atonement for the one for surcharge and the asham offering to Hashem. Uh, but he needn't pursue the victim to me uh, to media in order to pay him the fifth. He can give it to a court-appointed agent. But the concept of forgiveness, that another party can forgive the robber, is one of the issues. So it's saying, so we can see that the robbery can be forgiven, the principle exists, and the robber absolved of the obligations to return it. So we see from the Mishnah that although the robber did not fulfill the mitzvah, of returning the property guards that he stole. He is absolved of the obligation once the robbery is forgiven by his victim. Thus, there is no need for him to physically remove the article from his domain. We always thought it was a given. All that's necessary, guys, for him to achieve atonement is that he be cleansed of the stigma of having inverted commas robbed property in his possession. And this can be accomplished one of two ways. He, he can give a financial equivalent of it, or he can be forgiven by his victim. And it's that it's that critical that he can even proceed to bring his ashram offering at the point of forgiveness. Obviously, the one for surcharge, he does have to give to his victim. But he can even keep that object that he robbed in his hand if the victim forgave him for it while he's bringing the ashram offering. I mean, it's a crazy concept. But uh, proper forgiveness uh, means that article is no longer deemed or sullied to be robbed property. So, he's saying in our case too, once the robber inherits his father's estate, the article that he took illegally is no longer considered robbed property. Because his father, by virtue of his father's death, he, it's now his property, he inherited it. So why should he be required to physically remove it from his possession? That's Rashi's explanation. Okay? Now, the Gemara answers Rav Yochanan said, well, there seems to be a contradiction because in our Mishnah now, we're learning the 109th Mishnah, you steal something and you make a false oath and that person's father passes away, he has to give it to his brothers or his father's brothers. He can't keep it in his possession, it's a robbed item. And in 103, we learn this concept of basically that there could be a forgiveness aspect at which he doesn't have to return the robbed item. So Rav Yochanan is going to explain that there needn't be a contradiction or difficulty. So this Mishnah we're learning, uh, uh, well, not this one, the previous one in the 103rd Mishnah of Bava Kama, it states that the robber can be absolved through forgiveness 
And that reflects the opinion, guys, remember, of Rav Yosef Haglili. So Rav Yochanan is bringing over the case that there's no difficulty. But he's saying it's no difficulty if you get the opinion of Rav Yossi Haglili. Whereas the Mishnah currently in 109 that we're dealing with now, which implies that the robber has to physically remove the property from his possession, reflects the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. So we've got the two different Tanaim, and each one of them is on a different case. Rav Yossi Aglili says, uh, it's not a problem. You can uh, you can keep the item if the victim gives you of it as the robber. Rabbi Akiva is saying there is no such thing. That property which you stole, whether you forgive it or not, has to be removed from your property. Is that all clear? All we have is Rav, uh, Rabbi Akiva and Rav Yosef Haikalili, according to Rav Yochanan. Simple and straightforward. Now, it was taught in the Bryce of the Torah states regarding a case where the robbery victim died before he was repaid. Now, where do we see such a thing in Bad Mid Bad, Bad Mid Gas Bad Midbar Bad Bad Midbar Bad Midbar Bad Midbar? Yeah. You see, this is where I laugh because even though I understand the Gomorrah, um, all of you guys can say the word Bad Midbar without being tongue tied, so it just shows you how stupid I am. <laughs> so, just yeah. on a so anyway, in Numbers chapter 5, verse 8, Bar Midbar, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, um, Kevin, Kevin enjoyed that, yeah. No, yeah. sure he did, because Kevin's, he was Bite. astoundingly good. Okay, so so what what did we learn in uh, Bar Midbar, chapter 5, verse 8? Regarding a case where the robbery victim died before he was repaid. It's using this phrase that said, but if the man has no kinsman to whom the guilt offering can be returned, the returned guilt payment is for Hashem, for the Kohen. Now, um, generally, if the victim dies, the robber must make restitution to uh, his heirs. Now, where he has no heirs, the robber shall give the money to the Kohanim serving in the temple. Why? Because if you have a look at the word ha'asham, the guilt payment, that refers to a couple of different payments. If it's a for a false oath, there's a one for surcharge and asham. But asham can also refer purely to the principal amount of the robbery in case there's no false oath. The difference is you have to make a kapoor and pay back what you stole. So although this verse doesn't explicitly mention the one for surcharge, that amount too is paid to the Kwanim. And like any other robber guys who swore falsely and admitted to his guilt, the one whose victim died without heirs brings an Asham offering after making the required payment to the Kwanim. So that also goes to the Kwan. Okay. So the question arises in Bamed Bar. Okay, I have to keep saying that word to get it uh, correct. It's a tongue twister. So it's saying, look, if you look at any Jewish person, right? What Jewish person has amongst them no kinsman? Now, kinsman is an old-fashioned word. They used to use it in Robin Hood and Robin of Loxley, remember, and Guinevere and all those like, uh, like adventures, etc. Kinsman means that there's no one. When you go to the doctor and you go for enough surgeries like I do, they say, who's your next of kin? It's never a relaxing question you write down, ever, ever. And you just make sure the numbers are right and hope it all goes well, not south. So when they say, who amongst any Jew has no kinsman? It's obvious. Why? Because any born Jew has some relative. How do we know? All direct descendants from Yaakov Avinu and we related to all other born Jews. Now, accordingly, if the robbery victim was born Jewish, then even if he isn't survived by offsprings or siblings, he's got to have some relative, no matter how distant. And he inherits the debt that the robber owes him. Lucky guy. Okay? So, obviously, perforce, the verse then 
as to speak about a case of robbery from a convert who can in fact die without heirs. Why? Because you say, well, maybe this uh, convert has non-Jewish children. So we say biologically they might be his children, but there's no inheritance according to Jewish law. Because when a person converts to Judaism, his legal ties to his Gentile family are severed. So the only kinsmen he can possibly have that would stand up to Jewish law are offspring that he might produce after his conversion. If unfortunately he dies childless, he doesn't have any heirs. So the verse refers uh, to like a case where one robbed a convert and then he swore falsely to the convert and he said, I didn't steal from you. And the convert died childless. So in this case, if the robber wants to make a teshuva to the Kohanim, the false oath is alluded to in an earlier passage uh, because we said it's by Midbar chapter 5, verse 8. Now this is referred to in verse 6, which mentions a terrible term, treachery to Hashem, which means you're using Hashem's name in vain. That's the false oath. So the Bryser continues and he says, all right, uh, this uh, robber heard that this convert had died through the grapevine. He heard like the oak croaked or he just disappeared. So what what happened then is he wanted to make restitution to the Kuanim because he wanted to make a teshuva for the false oath and at least give the amount of money to um, the Kohen in lieu of his theft. Okay, now this is obviously holding according to Rabbi Akiva. As Rav Yosef Haglili, we're not actually sure what the story is yet, but we'll, we'll get to know now. Anyway, he packs his bags, and because he heard the convert isn't around town, he said he heard a rumor he's dead. So he quickly thought he'd uh, make restitution. He goes up to Yerusha line, and he brings the principal, the one for surcharge and Asham offering to Yerusha line. And lo and behold, guys, he walks and walks and walks and catches transport and takes him a couple of weeks. And in Jerusalem, who does he meet? Who do you think, guys, he meets? Convert. Yeah, you're the one he robbed. Feels a bit embarrassed and says, listen, this is for you. Uh, you know, you're actually alive. And I'll, I've got this. So, anyway, what we were saying is that the guy's sitting around town and they said, listen, he, now he is not discussing to anybody why. He said, have you seen the old man, the convert? And people said, no, we don't, haven't seen him, we haven't seen him, we haven't seen him. And then somebody said, I think he died, I really died or whatever. And then the oak felt terrible. He forget, all right, listen, anybody can die. It was coming to uh, Yom Kippur time, you know, the oaks get a bit of a fright. So he goes to Jerusalem with the principal, with the uh, one for surcharge and the ashram and figures. He better sort this out with the Kohen. And then who does he meet there? Lo and behold, he meets uh, the convert. And he said, listen, please, just take all of this. I did you wrong. I swore falsely. I want to give it to you. The ashram I'm still giving um, to, to, to the Kohanim. It's not a problem. Just... Uh, I'm pleased you're alive. Take it. Nice. And, That's yeah. the wrong supercharger here. Uh, two meters off. The wrong cable. Oh, you with Sorry. me, buddy? Yeah, I just came in something. Sorry. Okay, no problem. So, what happens is then the convert turned around to him and says, look, why don't you keep the money as a loan and pay me back another time? Because... um." Uh, basically what happened is the convert uh, exchanged the robbery debt for a loan. And the reason being is he realized this guy robbed him because he was quite a desperate guy. He was pretty poor himself and the convert had money. He had money. Do you get what I'm saying? It's not like he didn't have money. He was a wealthy guy. And this other guy wasn't. He said, I appreciate you doing the right thing. That was all I wanted. Keep it as a loan and then pay it back to me when you got a chance. And then what happens is the convert does what many old people do. He died. <laughs> okay. So when he died now, 
what actually happens is that there's a law. And the law is that if the convert had no uh, inheritance, then uh, basically you've got what you call hefke, which is ownerless, which is like Zorba the Greek, first come, first take. I don't know if you ever saw that movie Zorba the Greek when that oak croaked on the thing. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, they all came. Everybody from the village came, and you thought they were going to bury him properly. And they just each took rings from his fingers and jewelry, and they went to his house and they emptied the shelves. There was nothing left of what he had within two seconds. So it becomes Hefka that everybody's got first dibs on what that convert has. Okay, because there's no... Uh, there's nobody to claim it. In the case where there's nobody to claim it, there's no lawsuit that can go against you for keeping it, okay? So who do you think the first person is to acquire ownership? The one that already has money from the convert. Uh, it's in his account anyway. It's in his home. So therefore, he seized upon the uh, opportunity for ownership because uh, um, he became the debtor um, to the creditor who was the convert, and and therefore he's entitled to keep it by law. Uh, that's according to Rashi. So uh, we want to know uh, since uh, since that is the case, um, wh what's the law? And the law is very clear, guys. The robber acquires that which was in his possession. Okay. Now. Um, that that leads to a bit of a sticky uh, situation because these are the words of Rav Yossi Haglili, okay? So in other words, Rav Yossi Haglili said, listen, it's very, very straightforward. Uh, either, either way, um, the robber gets to acquire it since the assets are in his account the minute the victim dies. And therefore, possession is now intense of the law. If he's a convert with no heirs, then who's ever counted in obviously acquires ownership. Now, Rabbi Akiva does not agree with this at all. He says that the robber has no remedy until he removes his robbery from his possession, meaning that Rabbi Akiva maintains that even in this case, that the robber must fulfill the dictate to return the robbed property, and he must therefore physically remove it from his possession. Now, um, in the Bryce's case, since at the moment of the convert's death, the robber had possession of the money he owes the convert, he acquired the debt and in fact forgives it to himself. So again, this terms for giving it to himself is merely saying that the person to whom he owed it can't sue him. And by virtue of his death, he inherits the, um, uh, the asset and he doesn't have to pay back the debt. Uh, now, Rav Yossi Akalili considers him absolved. So, Rabbi Akiva does not. Okay. So, the main point of the argument between Rav Yossi Haglili and Rabbi Akiva is that they disagree whether a robber can technically seize the, forgive himself, in other words, seize the possession of the rob property because he was legalized. Uh, and, he, and it frees him of the uh, obligation to relinquish it, okay? Now, you could say that maybe this is an isolated case, but it's not. It pertains to all cases. It's a principle. Because um, according to Rav Yossi Aglili, whether one forgives a robbery debt for himself or for another, he is able to forgive it, and the ro robber is thereby absolved of his obligation to return it. Meaning, in the Bryce's case, the robber technically forgives himself by taking use of the acquired legal ownership of the property when the convert dies. In our Mishnah's case, too, the robber forgives himself by inheriting the property from his father because he is a legitimate heir. And in the case of the um, convert without any heirs, the money is in his possession, so therefore it's Hefka ownerless, and he has it. Okay? But um, in each instance, this term forgiveness isn't awarded by the victim. Why? 
because quite rightfully so, uh, they were dead. So firstly, if you remember, the father wasn't aware that the son stole from him. And number two, it's legalized by virtue of the fact that the one inherited it and the other one had it in his possession. But it was both caused by the death of the person that they took it from. Now, the previous Mishnah on 103a, by contrast, deals with something completely different, guys. With a case in which the victim actually forgot uh, the, the robber. So, in other words, the third party forgave the robber and releases him from the obligation to make restitution. Now, Rav Yossi Akalili maintains that it doesn't matter how forgiveness comes about. It's still effective. It still enables the robber to keep the property that he took. According to Rav Yochanan's explanation, he assumes that Rav Yossi Aglili's ruling in the Brisa isn't limited to the stated case in which a convert had converted the robbery, for example, into a loan. But it can apply even to a case where the convert simply died because he hadn't been paid yet. And in any event, his property becomes hefkir upon his death and the robber acquires it legally. Now, the atonement is a different issue. Atonement is a very different issue, but we're talking about the legality here. Now, according to Rabbi Akiva, according to Rav Yochanan's opinion of Rabbi Akiva, it doesn't matter whether a victim forgives the robber, in other words, forgives the debt of another, or a person forgives himself and says, well, I technically inherited it, it's in my possession, the person died, uh, it's okay. Either way, that's not an excuse. According to Rabbi Akiva, he has to remove the property from his uh, possession. So Rav Yochanan asserts that although Rabbi Akiva in the Brisa does address a case where the robber forgives himself and seems legally entitled to do so, the wave is ineffective. Uh, um, and even if you've got a more extreme case where the victim said to the robber, I know you come from a poor background and I've got a lot of money, I forgive you. He still has to remove the robbed property from his possession because that's what the Pasuk uh, is interpreted as, according to Rabbi Akiva, pretty clearly. Okay? So um, the first Mishnah, this is important in 103a, teaches that when a robbery debt is forgiven by the victim, a third party, the robber is absolved. And that follows the opinion of Rav Yossi Aglili. Our Mishnah in 109 teaches that when the robber inherits the rob property from his father, uh, or he has got possession of the convert who dies to whom he has money and he hasn't paid the money back, he, in fact, forgives himself of it, meaning legally he can keep it as heir and possessor. And therefore, um, that only holds by Rav Yossi Akalili, but according to the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, he has to basically um, uh, give it back. Okay. So, and if he, now, Can I just ask you something, David? Yeah. Quickly, one second. If he, if he gives it back, then that property becomes ownerless. So... Uh, he doesn't, he never gets it. Okay, it's a good point. So what Gavin says, so what's the point if no one benefits? Well, the point of it is that we can have a discussion is that when the convert converts it from a robbery to a loan, there might be less of an issue because he's addressed it with the victim himself. Or do we say that if the... Uh, convert really forgave him he would have said just keep it the fact that he held him to pay it back meant that he didn't really want the money stolen from him it wasn't a free gift Gavin so that's what's going to be discussed and then the second point to your question which is astute is either way that money should go immediately to the Kohen in order not to uh, get punished for number one the theft to make an atonement for the a uh, false uh, declaration, which is a treachery to Hashem, and to absolve yourself in the eyes of Hashem, whether you legally can keep it or not. 
Okay. So the previous mission informs, does that satisfy you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Pleasure. Didn't want All to right. you. Thank you. So, Kevin, the bottom line is the previous mission informs us that Rav Yossi Aglili's opinion that the robber can keep the property if the victim forgives him. Okay, so we know that. That was in 103. So we deduce from this that the same holds true in any other case where the robber's possession of the property is actually legalized. In other words, uh, if it's legalized and you rob a convert, he doesn't have any heirs, You've got his assets, uh, then find his keepers. It's Hefke, it's ownerless. Or, you, or that uh, thief robs his father, inherits him because uh, he's one of the heirs. He can keep the robbed property. Okay? But our Mishnah in 109 informs us that there's a dissenting opinion of Rabbi Akiva. That it doesn't matter if the robber inherits his father and he was entitled to it before the robbery. He's no longer an active heir. He's got to remove the robbed property from his possession. And the same holds true, Kev, according to the current explanation, where even if the victim forgives the robber, the robber doesn't have this special uh, edict to keep stolen property. Even if he's forgiven, say it's forgiven in Shemaim, but he's not allowed to keep that stolen property. So either he's got to give it to Tzedakah or return it to the original owner if the owner's dead then uh, give it to the heirs of his father etc etc uh, being his brothers or his uh, father's brothers okay now uh even so so that's uh, that's where we're going with this now just one other point Rav Yochanan continues to clarify the Brisa because we we need one point cleared up according to Rav Yossi Aglili the law is actually the same, even in a case where the convert did not say to the robber, listen, you need the money, I'm going to loan it to you, let's call it a debt and you pay me back every month. If it's left as a robbery uh, and a debt, and he never saw um, uh, the convert on the way to Yerushalayim and didn't pay it back for whatever reason, even in this case, Rav Yossi maintains that upon the convert's death, the robber can still acquire the property legally because if the convert doesn't have any heirs, then there's no one to claim it legally. So if you keep it, no one can sue you. So the question uh, 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 goes in a case saying that basically, what was this whole issue of a loan? In other words, either way, According to Rav Yossi Akilili, if the robber can keep it because it's in his possession, what are you talking about loans for? Now, this is the uh, interesting part, is that the reason the Bryce has stated and he converted the robbery into a loan option um, is to inform you of the strength of Rabbi Akiva's opinion. Because even when the convert said, listen, let's make it a loan, Rabbi Akiva holds that the robber will always have that money as tainted because how did he get it in the first place, Gavin? Arth, how did he get it? Arthur with it, Jesus. Yeah, by stealing it. Exactly. So Rabbi Akiva says exactly like Arthur. He stole it. Just because the converts are now nice saying you need money and we can now turn it into a loan doesn't mean that it wasn't illicit gains. If he'd have come to the person before and says, I need to borrow money, different story. But because he got it illegally and the, uh, the convert happened to be a good guy and say, listen, can pay me back. I know you don't have the money or whatever. Doesn't mean that he ever acquired it with permission. And therefore, Rabbi Akiva holds that even if it's now become a loan debt as opposed to a robbery, that he has no remedy for Kapora until he removes the robbed item from his possession. So the whole reason, according to Rav Yochanan, that he's bringing this case about a, uh, a robbery converted to a loan is to prove that accordingly, um, uh, Rabbi Akiva says it doesn't matter 
the way you gained it was horrific, it was illegal, it was against somebody's will. So to summarize, Rav Yochanan's explanation of the dispute is as follows. According to both Tanoim, Rav Yossi Akalili and Rabbi Akiva, there is no difference, guys, whether the victim converted the robbery debt to a loan or left it intact as a robbery. There's also no difference between a case where the victim forgave the robber and a case where the victim basically forgave himself. In other words, he actually acquired ownership legally through the victim's death, whether it was his father or the convert. Either way, there's a consistency because in both cases, Rav Yossi Haglili maintains that once the robber's possession is somehow legalized, he's absolved of the obligation to return the stolen property and he can keep it legally. So in other words, according to Rav Yossi Haglili, when it is forgiven legally, it's forgiven in Shemaim. Rabbi Akiva maintains that it's not legal to keep it and it's not forgiven in Shemaim, that the robber always remains obligated to physically remove the property from his possession. And there's no waiver just before because you're forgiven by the victim. You've got to get rid of it. Okay? So that... Uh, uh, guys, I don't want to go over time. How much time did we spend in the previous year? Okay. 39 minutes. How much? It was a joke. 39 minutes. <laughs> 39 minutes and 27 seconds. Do you want to end here or can we spend another 10 minutes? We haven't gone over time at all, but it's up to you guys. You can do another 10 minutes. I love the guilt. You're, you're, you're like a great parent. Okay. You know that. <laughs> all right, so let's, let's go through it. it. <laughs> okay, so that was Rav Yochanan's interpretation. Rav Sheshes does not agree with it at all. He said, listen, if this is so, Rav Yossi maintains his opinion, even when the robbery debt has not been converted to a loan, and he holds that the robber is able to forgive himself of the debt by virtue of the fact that uh, the victim has died, then it leaves us with a problem. Because when you teach the law that applies to Rav Yossi Akalili, that the Mishnah informs us that if one can forgive himself of the robbery debt, obviously we can deduce that the victim certainly has the power to forgive the robber. That's so obvious. It's more of an unusual um, uh, concept to realize that you can forgive yourself of the debt. But the fact that another person can forgive you, obviously you'll learn that. And if you're teaching a law according to Rabbi Akiva, that you can't forget and forgive the debt of somebody else because they trespassed against you, Obviously, you're going to pick up that you can't suddenly forgive yourself. And so I'm a nice guy. Legally, it's cool. So this is the important part. The first Mishnah, according to Rav Shashis, teaches that one can forgive the robbery debt for another. You can. The victim can always forgive the robber. And the second Mishnah teaches that you can't forgive yourself and automatically say, I'm a good guy. Because the son can't keep that which he inherits. Okay, so it seems that both Mishnayos, according to Rav Sheshes, were authored by a single Tana. You don't have this case where it's like Rav Yosef, uh, Yosef Aglili, and then it's Rav Yakiva. They're both authored by the same Tana. And this Tana just happens to distinguish a case in which uh, there's a third party forgiveness versus unbeing able to forgive yourself. So Rav Shashia says, listen, there's definitely another explanation. You can either say that both opinions of Ra are according to Rav Yossi Aglili, or you can say both opinions are according to Rav Yossi But you can't say that one opinion is Rav Yossi Aglili and the other one is Rav Yossi They're both, they're both either sh uh, shared by the one tunnel or the other. So Ra Rav Shashia says the following. Uh, so both this Mishnah and that Mishnah reflect the opinion of Rav Yossi Haglili. Because when, guys, did Rav Yossi Haglili say that one can forgive the obligation to return rob property? It's only in a case where one forgives it for another. In other words, the victim can choose to forgive the robber 
And then in that case, in the 103rd daf, the robber is absolved. But you can't forgive yourself of that obligation just because the victim is dead. You can say, well, legally you're entitled to the inheritance. If it's your father or if it's a convert, you turn around and say, well, it's Hefka ownerless who's going to sue. I've got the money, so sorry about you. Um, so why does Rav Yossi Aglili rule in the Brisa that when a convert who was robbed dies, the robber acquires that which was in his possession? And this is the interesting point, according to Rav Sheshes. It's because the victim converted the robbery debt to a loan upon the robber. Now, Rav Yossi stated his ruling specifically regarding the case in which the convert guys told the robber to hold the money as a loan. So in that case, the convert, in effect, forgave the robbery debt for the robber and in its place established a new system of repayment okay it was a debt so it's no longer considered rob property so when the former robber acquires the ownership upon the convert's death the reason he's allowed to keep it is that Rav Yossi recognizes the victim's ability to forgive the robbery as a third party and forgive the debt of another okay but it doesn't indicate according to Rav Sheshes that the robber can just take it for himself just because the um, convert doesn't have any uh, heirs. He acquired it illegally. Okay? Now, Rav Akiv, on the other hand, um, rules that even if a victim declared the robbery debt as a loan, the robber remains obligated to remove it from his possession. So even the victim is unable to forgive a robbery debt for another. So that's the proof that because there's such a contradictory opinion that Rabbi Akiva doesn't acknowledge this debt to loan story for a robbery, that both opinions, according to Rav Sheshes, has to be consistent. And therefore, they would have to uh, follow Rav Yossi Hakalili because this issue, as far as a robbed item turning into a loan, would have to make sense as relevant. Because if you ignored it, no matter what, why well, bring it up? Now, there's a different opinion, but it, it actually rides upon the same concept. Because Ravi, uh, Ravi said, both this Mishnah and that Mishnah, in 103 and 109, actually reflect the, uh, the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, both of them. Not Ravi. Yeah, Damon, we've lost, uh, we've lost our, uh, Kevin, eh? What at what point? I don't know. I just saw it now. I can't answer that. I don't know if it's just kicking us out or or what. There's Kevin. He's back. Yeah. Uh, I, to, I, have to, I have to charge. No, no, my my father. There's no power to charge my computer. So luckily, okay, yeah, the but phones at are. At what the point option. did I lose you? Do you understand why? Ago. Okay, so Rav Shaysha says in a nutshell. The reason why they have to both be Rav Yossi Aglili is because it has to be consistent. And what we're learning here from Rav Yossi Aglili, Rav Shashis is saying, is that only a third party can forgive. In other words, only a victim can forgive a robber. A robber can't turn around and say, well, his father died, he inherited it, it's there for his money. He can't turn around when a uh, convert dies and say, well, he's got the money, it's forgiven. You can't do that. The only thing that Rav uh, uh, Shashis is saying is that Rav Yosef Haglili is saying that a third party, Kevin, can forgive. So what happened is, as far as this, uh, the, uh, we learned in the 103, in Mishnah 103 in Baba Kama, we learned that the victim can forgive the robber of the principal, and then he doesn't have to travel all the way to media to pay the one for surcharge and ashram. A third party can forgive, but a person can't forgive themselves, meaning helping themselves just because the victim dies. So, and the reason why he's saying it's consistent with Rav Yossi Akdelili is he said, what the heaven was the point of this whole issue that he bumps the... Uh, custodian, uh, sorry, Kevin, that he bumps into the convert on the way to Jerusalem is because the convert says to him, listen, I'm a wealthy guy. 
You robbed me because you don't have money. Let's turn it into a loan. I've got more than enough money. Pay it off. And at that point, he decriminalized and forgave him while he was alive, the convert. And that's the only reason that when he dies, that the uh, robber is entitled to keep those gains because A, the uh, convert has no heirs, but B, it's not an illegal acquisition at the point where it was forgiven by the third party as a loan. And therefore, it cannot be Rabbi Akiba. It doesn't hold that this issue has any weight about whether it was a loan uh, from a, a robbed item to a loan. So that was Rav Sheshes' opinion. Now, Rava is going on a similar train of thought where he says, listen, both that Mishnah and this Mishnah Ren reflects the opinion of Rabbi Akiva because he's also saying that there's an inconsistency if you say that the one opinion is Rav Yossi Haglili and the other one's Rabbi Akiva. And he's saying, Rava, that the reason why that both have to be the opinion in Rab, uh, of Rabbi Akiva is you can't forgive the obligation to return robbed property where you're forgiving yourself. He's agreeing with Rav Sheshes that you're only able to forgive the um, sins of another, but you can't help yourself to stuff and say, I'm a tzaddik, I forgive myself. You can't do that. Okay? Um, so, so in other words, Rav explains that the dispute is that um, that, how do, how do I say it in a very, very simple way, is uh, Rav explains the dispute in the opposite manner because Rav Yossi Haglili and Rabbi Akiva disagree that the robber can forgive himself. So basically, according to this interpretation, the reason why both Mishnahs follow Rabbi Akiva is because Rabbi Akiva is turning around and saying that uh, the victim can forgive the robber, okay, but he never forgive the robber in, in in this particular case. Why did he never forgive the robber, uh, Kevin? This is important. Is because the convert never turned around to the robber and say, "All right, get off the hook with the debt." That's a proper forgiveness. Stole a hundred grand, leave it. It's not a problem. He says, "No, you owe it to me. You took it." But we're going to make it a loan because if you give it over, you're going to be poverty stricken. Meaning he didn't he didn't forgive the amount. Otherwise, he wouldn't have converted it to a loan. Is a key, Arthur? Are you there? Is Kevin? Everybody's falling asleep. Can you give me a few minutes, guys? I'm not. I'm not sleeping. No, I'm just tired. I'm, 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 is the the proof that Rava is saying that they both hold by Rabbi Akiva and that you have to return the robbed item uh, is because uh, Rabbi Akiva, according to Rava, Rabbi Akiva is saying that the convert never forgave the robber. Why? It's because forgiveness is saying, don't pay it back, leave it, it's done. He didn't forgive it. He said, I know you can't pay it back at the moment. It's going to impoverish you. It's a loan. Let's make it a loan. But I want the money back. You never had permission to take it from me. I want it back every month. That way you can pay it back because I'm not entitled to lose 100000 I'm not entitled to it. But I know you're going through a bit of a, a, a difficulty. And because he never forgave him by just writing off the debt, and that's the point, it is proof that uh, um, uh, it's according to Rabbi Akiva that the robber has to return the money to the coin. So the Gemara questions Rabbi's explanation. It says, that implies that Rav Yossi Akilili holds that even one can forgive a robbery debt for himself. It follows that if a convert who was robbed died without converting the robbery debt to a loan, the robber is absolved upon the convert's death when he acquires ownership. Accordingly, this is a, against Rava. Consider the law about the robbed property of a convert who dies without heirs, which the mercy for one stated in this Torah that it's given to the Kohanim. How can you find this law to be applicable? Because you state, Rava, that the convert's death, the robber, is absolved in any event. So what this argument against Rava is, is it's saying is that either way it's Hefka. 
And therefore, since the robber has possession of the money, he can keep it. So where do you come up with this theory that he can't keep it since we know he can, it's ownerless? And who's to say that he never forgave him of the robbery and gave him a chance of a loan with dignity? And maybe he didn't want to lose 100 grand, not because of lack of forgiveness, because he's not entitled to. So the Gomorrah answers, Rabbi said, what are we dealing with here in the verse which requires payment to the Kuanim? It's a case where one robbed a convert and swore falsely to him. And the convert died without leaving any heirs. And the robber admitted his guilt after the convert's death. So at that time of the confession, Hashem in his kindness acquired the robbed property and awarded it to the Kohanim to give him a chance uh, for Teshuvah. Okay, let me just... So let me just say what I'm saying. The robber's obligation to return the principal at all costs and pay the one for surcharge takes effect at the time that he admits his guilt, guys. Because that's in Bab Midbar chapter 5, verse 7, which states, when they confess their sin that they committed, he shall make restitution for his guilt in its principal amount and add fist to it. So when the succeeding verse states, if the man died and he has no kinsman, the returned guilt payment is for Hashem, for the coin, it refers to a case where confession occurred after the convert's death. In that situation, guys, Hashem acquires the rights to the payment at the time of the robber's confession. That's why I can't keep the money. Okay, that's uh, what Rava would tell you, because that right goes to the Kohanim, because he has to make atonement at that point and pay back the principal, the one for surcharge and Asham, because of his false oath. Had he made no false oath um, and just taken the money, there would be pretty much little uh, that could be done uh, as far as that's concerned. Okay. Now, uh, Hashem's decreed regarding this case that the confession triggers an obligation even though the convert has died. Because the robber has to make re a restitution for his false oath to achieve atonement. And that's why he has to give it to the Kohen. Okay? So upon the convert's death, the robber requires the rights and forgives himself. In other words, if the if he robbed a convert and didn't swear falsely to him, convert dies without heirs, the robber can certainly keep the property in his possession. It's because he took a false oath using Hashem's name. And he admitted his guilt. He wants a teshuva. He has to give the money to the coin in order to gain atonement. But both of them, according to Rav, is proving that the convert didn't forgive the debt um, uh, um, and, and wanted the money paid back, even though he forgave him of the robbery, which means it wasn't a forgiveness. Yeah, I'll just keep the money. According to Rav Sheshes, uh, there was a forgiveness, and therefore the victim forgave the robber third-party forgiveness, and therefore uh, that was the basis of uh, saying both opinions were according to Rav Yossi Agni. Okay, and the first opinion was Rav Yochanan. All right, guys, we're done. Damon, tomorrow night they obviously can't be sure because of uh, Sisha Bav and also Thursday as well. Yeah. So we'll resume again on what's yeah, the Saturday night. Gavin, where are you going? Are you going to the base for the program?